interactive. I'd like this to be more interactive uh, if, uh, if, if it is okay with you. So I would like to see in between uh, as I invite you to also participate. Um, I hope that uh, the chat function is uh, enabled for the participants to provide their comments uh, and their, their views. So uh, I wouldn't like it to be a one-way talk, uh, rather, you know, as we go, even in the question and answer session, I would like to um, discuss some of the ideas with you. But even uh, during my presentation, I would like you to uh, interact with me, is, if it is okay with you. Can uh, Uchita confirm that uh, you yes. know, people will be able to uh, interact as well? Yes, the chat is, the chat option is enabled and uh, however you would like the interaction to be, we can take it in that direction. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Uh, um, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, it's visible. So you can see my PowerPoint presentation. Isn't yeah. it? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for confirming. You know, as uh, I was introduced, I work for the Commonwealth of Learning's Regional Center, the Commonwealth Educational Media Center for Asia, which is based out of Delhi. And uh, I want to spend a minute or two talking to you about the Commonwealth of Learning and the Regional Center in Delhi, uh, partly because, uh, you know, it's also due to some selfish reasons I want to do that. Um, we would like to attract uh, some of you as uh, our interns. If you would like to intern with us, uh, we want to open up this opportunity. But having said that, you need to know who we are uh, and if you would be interested to join us. So that's why I want to introduce uh, in the next uh, minute or two about Commonwealth of Learning. Commonwealth of Learning is the one and the only international intergovernmental organization based out of Vancouver. Uh, hosted by the Canadian government uh, uh, and also the British Columbia government. And this uh, happened in 1987 as a result of uh, one of the Chogams. Chogams is uh, the Commonwealth Heads of State uh, uh, meetings that happen every two years. And um, at one of the Chogams in 1987, when uh, the, the world leaders, particularly the Commonwealth Heads of States met together, in Vancouver, uh, they had this proposal to start an organization purely for edtech, purely for open distance and uh, technology enabled learning purposes. Because uh, way back uh, th 35 years ago, <laughs> they recognized the need for uh, such a, a global institution to be present. And uh, so if uh, you have all joined uh, this course at TIS, you should be reassured that uh, you know for 35 years uh, we have been uh, uh, promoting this concept of ODL and technology enabled learning and you are at the right place because uh, there's a lot to be done. What we could not achieve over the past 35 years, interestingly COVID, the uh, COVID pandemic uh, enabled us to fast track the process. When people never wanted to go online for learning, we had seen this kind of uh, emergency remote teaching that uh, uh, was happening during the COVID time. And uh, thankfully, many organizations haven't uh, looked back, although some of the organizations have gone back to normalcy. But uh, the, uh, the COVID pandemic also uh, taught us what it means to actually uh, use open distance, online digital technology enabled flexible blended learning systems in our learning and skill development paradigm. So my organization works in this area, working largely with open schools, open universities, uh, education institutions that uh, have open and distance learning practice. Uh, and a variety of those are today in this uh, realm of affairs. And uh, as a result of the national education policy and the reforms that are happening in our country, uh, even in India, we see a large number of uh, institutions that have attained some quality benchmark are allowed to start online programs. Uh, uh, so there are notifications by the University Grants Commission to uh, start online programs uh, uh, every now and then. And so a large number of institutions are likely to start uh, 
uh, uh, technology enable learning uh, programs particularly employment oriented skill based micro credentials to even uh, online uh, degree and uh, uh, post graduate programs and uh, we have also seen in recent years online uh, doctorate programs also initiated alongside uh, what they call the joint uh, degree programs and so on so there is an international movement happening around uh, the whole realm of online education. So the, this uh, is uh, very fundamentally interesting to you because as students, you are uh, looking into ed tech as well as uh, um, uh, educational practice. So I wanted to introduce my organization in that light. And should any of you be interested at any point in time to intern with us for uh, a period of two months to six months, uh, you could always approach us through uh, Professor uh, Amina Charania. We would uh, be willing to consider having you on board uh, uh, in Delhi with us uh, for a short period of time. So that was my selfish uh, motive and the introduction to Commonwealth of Learning. That said, uh, let us move on with the presentation. Is the slide moving? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now it was so you can see day of ai slide right uh, yes your... yes yes the day oh. of ai slide yeah wonderful wonderful thank you so i i've been asked by professor charania to speak to you on this topic day of ai and ai curriculum development in primary education opportunities and challenges this was the topic uh, provided to me at a, a, a period at a time when uh, this uh, movement called Day of AI is actually taking up. And as pioneers, uh, the MIT, Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, and the MIT lab in particular, have been putting out a lot of interesting things. And the MIT is the one, uh, way back in 1990s, late 1990s, opened up their curriculum as open curriculum. So they started a movement called OCW, uh, Open Curriculum Wear Movement, Open Course Wear Movement, which is even today popular. So uh, as you would know, MIT has been uh, doing a lot of interesting things. And uh, one of the things that they've uh, done is uh, this uh, AI for everyone uh, through this idea called Day of AI. And uh, if one would want to know what is Day of AI, it's actually a, a project of MIT, uh, RACE. RACE stands for Responsible AI for Social Empowerment and Education. And the researchers who belong to MIT RACE actually came up with this novel idea of Day of AI, basically as a low barrier, high impact, short curriculum program, which is freely offered to anybody who is at uh, K-12. So K-12 students from primary to secondary level students and teachers, if they want to learn more about AI, um, this is the curriculum to look, look up to. And in recent years, uh, Day of AI got launched in uh, uh, various places. Initially, they started this for the US, uh, United States uh, schools and students, particularly students and teachers. But um, of late, uh, you know, we have seen AI, day of AI movement uh, move around. In the Philippines with the Unilab Foundation, they started something called the day of AI Philippines. Day of AI Australia is another interesting movement uh, that is in, in the making and uh, becoming vibrant. And with uh, the Commonwealth of Learning's uh, regional center, SEMCA, they are launching day of AI India. And in, in fact, yesterday, Professor Charania, myself, and the MIT team, we all had a, a discussion to discuss uh, as to how we could uh, make it uh, really an interesting launch in December in Delhi. So we are contemplating how this could be brought to India. And uh, you are the one of those early birds who are actually learning more about uh, what we intend doing through this Day of AI program. So it's a moment in the making. But I'll come back to Day of AI and the curriculum and uh, the opportunities and the challenges in a while. Uh, but before that, uh, I want to really have this as a, an interactive webinar. So what I would like to see is uh, if uh, you could use uh, 
the chat function, you could uh, perhaps uh, type or uh, if you want to unmute yourself and, uh, and speak, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, for a few seconds, your take, uh, I would uh, really appreciate that. So what I want to do is to basically talk about uh, the primary education scenario of our country. And uh, what has been the generic problem identified in recent years, although this is a diversion from the main topic of AI, but I still want us to ponder in the next 10 minutes as to where the primary education landscape in India stands today. Now, one of the problems that uh, uh, people have identified is accessibility and affordability. And this is where I want you to you know, start uh, typing in your chat box as to how you see, you know, you are all masters and experts in your own field. And what, how do you see accessibility and affordability as a, a generic problem in primary education domain? So feel free to type uh, as you wish, or if you want to unmute yourself, you can unmute and uh, say uh, a sentence or two with regard to accessibility and affordability. I'm not yet seeing anybody typing. Poor salary for teachers. Ramesh Kade has written poor salary for teachers, infrastructure issues. Okay. Um, around accessibility and affordability, if you want to mention anything, that would be great. Uh, do you think uh, primary education is accessible or inaccessible? And primary education is affordable or uh, unaffordable? What is your take? Okay, Kriti Tripathi says lack of training, less teachers. Shashikant Shankar says uh, no training on digital skills within TPAC framework. And uh, Parul, Dr. Parul says state is responsible. Um, yeah, quite a few of your ideas are emerging, which is really, really wonderful. Achana Mehandel says government schools are largely accessible, affordable which is fantastic an answer. Uh, Bindu Tirumalai is saying it is accessible in the public education system. Um, Sadakat, uh, access is there, but quality is a, a concern. Quality is not affordable. Lack of training on digital skills, it's accessible, but quality of education varies. I think these are all excellent answers and uh, you are grasping the idea very well. Um, Kriti again says it's not accessible to many. Uh, in government schools, not affordable, Rajna Rajwan says. Parents don't want to send children to government schools because of poor quality. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, you have really assessed and understood the problems uh, very well because uh, as you say, these are the issues that we are facing. On one hand, uh, you know, we... We want uh, our children to go to school and we want it to be accessible. Uh, but when it comes to children from uh, uh, low economic status, children from uh, uh, you know disability, persons with disability or what they call special ability, uh, many a times it becomes a, a challenging proposition. When it comes to affordability, of course, uh, government schools are affordable. But uh, as uh, many of you mentioned, uh, the quality issues are uh, apparent there. Now, do you think uh, the curriculum in government schools, or for that matter, primary education, let's forget about government schools, let's think about uh, primary education at large. Uh, there is a problem that's identified as misaligned curriculum. Is that something that you relate with? You, you see this as uh, an issue? You can feel free to type. Uh, Kruthinath says everyone is lethargic to accept a new and modern education technology. So there is this notion called misaligned curriculum and also substandard pedagogy. And uh, you know, you all as students of ed tech and uh, uh, teacher education, you do have a, a very clear understanding and uh, going forward, you would uh, gain a, a more in-depth understanding of uh, why pedagogy is extremely important and uh, what it uh, plays as a role in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, you know it should be modern, it should be up to date. 
And uh, I think rightly, some of you have mentioned, Shashikant uh, again mentioned, uh, pedagogy is the biggest concern, not only in primary, but also in higher education. We see um, Bindu Thirumala again saying, no, it's not an issue. Curriculum is good. Pedagogy is traditional. So there is a view that uh, curriculum is not misaligned. Perhaps curriculum is fine, but um, it's uh, the, the pedagogy is traditional. So keep uh, keep typing because uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, Uchita and uh, Dr. Charania and others can uh, easily cut and paste all your comments into something meaningful so that uh, you can use this as a kind of a peer review notes for yourselves uh, going forward. Uh, substandard pedagogy is easy to blame on teachers, whereas many teachers are coping with having to attend multi-grade classrooms, varying demands on teachers, administrate, administration as such. That's very, very true, um, Anusha Ramanathan. Um, is lack of choice of curriculum also an issue? Because this has been also noted. And, um, uh, you know, I'm actually flagging all this uh, to basically justify uh, certain things that are happening in our country. So you can uh, put your own thoughts around uh, the lack of choice of curriculum. Uh, although some of us feel that the curriculum is fine, but uh, deficit perspective towards teachers and blaming teachers, uh, Dr. Parulanan says, but uh, do you think, you know, as students, when you studied, were you limited to studying only certain subjects? Would you have really loved studying something different from what uh, you were taught? Lack of qualified teachers, uh, although some of us mentioned that uh, the teachers are good, but they have been uh, forced to do a lot of other things. But unfortunately, if you really move around and see in some of the places, particularly in uh, the eastern part of India and uh, northern part of India, there is this concept called uh, para teachers. And the para teachers are really paid poor salaries and uh, not uh, really provided with any, any uh, professional development. And, uh, you know, they have never been in the last many years, two decades or so, been made permanent. So there are these issues of para-teachers in our system. There's also this issue, whereas we discussed this even earlier, accessibility and affordability in private school versus public schools. And a lot of uh, parents uh, do not want to send their children to the pr public schools. Uh, although, you know, education is a, a government subject, a, a guaranteed uh, um, notion, because we are all, all governments signed up to the education for all, you know, uh, goals and uh, the sustainable development goals uh, for goal four and uh, the targets thereafter uh, talks a lot about uh, public provision of education and our investment needs to go up, particularly at the primary level. Uh, is there a rote learning culture? Is that a problem? Have you gone through this? Uh, Anusha Ramanathan again says lack of choice of curricula due to a return on investment issue in schools and uh, very traditional choices by parents for certain streams and courses. Uh, no doubt every parent would like us to take science or <laughs> you know maths uh, subjects uh, uh, so that uh, you know children could become engineers and doctors. But, um, you know, the, there is this peer pressure and the parental pressure as well, and the lack of exposure to a variety of uh, skills, uh, 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 career opportunities and uh, job profiles uh, uh, that, are, uh, that are available. And, uh, you know, I want to mention here that uh, in 10 years' time, we do not know 50% of the job roles that are going to emerge in 10, 10 years' time. So unfortunately, we are in a situation where we are preparing our uh, uh, future workforce for career choices that we don't even know. That's one of the reasons we are limited to what we see and uh, what we are aware of. Uh, and uh, you know, the choices obviously are uh, humanities, science, commerce curriculum. We don't uh, go beyond this. There is this also this problem of examination-oriented system, whether it is uh, uh, your school board exam or uh, the entrance exam. We are unfortunately tutored and tuned towards the examination-oriented uh, culture rather than a, a learning culture. 
Now there is also a teacher-centered uh, approach to, to a learner-centered learner approach. And oftentimes uh, teachers uh, uh, do take that role of teaching too seriously, which, which is uh, important, but uh, they should also consider becoming um, facilitators and uh, encouraging learners. Again, if I pause and look at uh, Dr. Parul Anand's statement, examinations are systemic assault towards learning culture and supports uh, meritocracy. So many schools feel safe not to innovate and introduce new subjects that may not be scoring subjects. These, these are all very, very valid points. And uh, this is what uh, I think uh, as future leaders in education, you are called to change. And uh, you know, if uh, I see about uh, 47 of you in the uh, webinar room, and each one of you would have an opportunity to change this going forward. And the regulations and regulators are also sometimes too heavy, giving that uh, limited opportunity for schools to innovate, uh, to bring in uh, new curriculum in their design, new uh, teaching methodologies in their design and so on. So there are uh, these issues uh, that are facing us. Now let's uh, go to how do we actually move towards the next uh, century uh, or the next decade at least. Now is the landscape changing? That's the question. And uh, I think uh, Ms. Anusha Ramanathan is alluding here. What she's saying is examinations, examination is now even more test mode, more digitization and app-based test gathering on weekly tests and results being uploaded. And this has led to more of a test culture. You know, there are things that are happening, even, you know, technology enables us to do things interestingly, but unfortunately, are we really um, slaving towards technology or are we using technology to our advantage? Are we creating a, a new culture called as Anusha Ramanathan says, uh, testing culture or test culture? And are we here compromising skills, skill-based learning? And uh, uh, as again, Dr. Parul, says uh, no subjective examination, uh, you know, things are quite summative. Now, when it comes to landscape, let us look at uh, the national education policy that has come up recently. Now, you know, uh, colleagues uh, and friends, uh, you should know that uh, there is this target set out by the government that 100% uh, gross enrollment ratio in primary education by 2030, which means no one is left behind so as a committed uh, country towards the sustainable development goals, we are saying that 100% uh, of our children will be in schools. But what is the situation? The situation is that uh, two crore children are out of school today. Now, in other words, uh, you know, if you consider 25 crore children, two crore children are out of school. Close to 8% of the children are out of school. And this is a grave concern. When it comes to two crore, which is uh, 20 million, many countries in our in our uh, globe, almost 70 plus countries have population less than 20 million. Whereas in our uh, country, we have this challenge of two crore children, two million children out of school. Now there is this new paradigm that's coming up. Five plus three plus three plus four classified into ages 3 to 8, 8 to 11, 11 to 14, and 14 to 18. And uh, uh, this subsumes also three years of preschooling. So hereafter, we would be talking about preschool, primary school, uh, and uh, secondary and senior secondary levels, not uh, the way that uh, we have gone through. You know, if you recall, you all studied uh, up to fifth standard, uh, what they call the primary up to eighth standard, what they call upper upper primary or, um, you know, whatever in different places they call. Then you had ninth and 10th and 10th, 11th and 12th. But hereafter, we are going to have actually, um, instead of uh, K-12, 12 years of schooling, we are going to have from 3 to 18. In other words, 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 is 15 years, right? So 15 years, we are going to remain in school, which is going to be an interesting shift. So that's happening as we go. 
The next thing that is happening that uh, as we go is uh, emphasis on foundational literacy and numeracy. You know, ASER, which is a, 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 a kind of an annual assessment uh, report that is put out by Pratham, an NGO in our country, categorically says that uh, children are not learning to their grades. When they assess children who belong to fifth grade, they have the aptitude, skills, and uh, knowledge for a child of grade two rather than grade five because the compulsory pass uh, you know, class has enabled them to uh, move up the ladder, but without uh, knowledge and skills and uh, competencies for the particular age group. Now, there will be an emphasis on foundational literacy and numeracy, which is very, very fundamental for uh, future of AI. There is no separation likely to be between academic, extracurricular, and occasional streams. This is something that's happening. And uh, occasional education is going to start from classes six onwards, including internship. So in the future, you have to be mindful of this fact that uh, from class six onwards, one subject will be an occasional subject. It could be AI, it could be carpentry, it could be joinery, it could be anything based on what uh, the, the school is interested in uh, uh, doing. So uh, basically, this is something that's actually happening as we go. Now, internship culture, although I have promoted internship for uh, SEMCA amongst all of you, uh, there is going to be an option from sixth standard onwards uh, to basically go through internship. Now, there is an early emphasis, emphasis on early childhood and child care and education, and NCRT is likely to come up with a framework. Now, let us also quickly run through what other changes are happening. Now, school curriculum and pedagogy. Earlier, we discussed about pedagogy and we said it's traditional. Uh, we are finding it, uh, uh, you know, curriculum is fine, but the pedagogy is uh, to be modernized and so on. But it's interestingly, the uh, national education policy recognizes that 21st century skills, soft skills and vocational skills are likely to be embedded, including STEM concepts are going to be embedded in school curricula in every subject. That's something likely to happen. And as uh, you know, students and uh, faculty members, uh, you have an enormous opportunity to contribute. Now, we also talked about assessment, examination culture, test culture. There is uh, something called PARAK, which is going to be established in India as a national testing agency, NTA. So there will be a lot of changes in assessment and uh, we will also quickly look at uh, what AI can do in our assessment in the future. There is also going to be multilingual and mother tongue learning that's likely to happen uh, in the coming days. And uh, there is also this uh, ambition that uh, at least up to fifth standard, everyone should be allowed to learn in the mother tongue and it could go up to eighth standard. So that's something that uh, the government is uh, really looking to introduce. We're also looking at inclusive education. Earlier, we talked about persons with disability uh, and so on, uh, lack of diversity and uh, inclusion in our education system. Uh, but this is likely to be taken care of. And uh, we talked about para teachers uh, and uh, lack of uh, career path and uh, um, professional development opportunity for students, teachers. So there will be changes in teacher recruitment and career path for teachers. And uh, recently on the 5th of September, there is this uh, Malvia mission that was launched uh, uh, for teacher education uh, and the teacher training and uh, teacher capacity building. And uh, the school governance is likely to be robust because they are experimenting with the new forms of school governance, which are not likely to be simply the uh, even if it is a private school, the governing board is not likely to be the owners of the school. There is going to be larger stakeholdership in school governance. And the last point is something that is very, very relevant to today's uh, webinar. We need to understand that STEM and AI concepts are likely to be taken very, very seriously. So let us quickly move on to the next uh, stage of my talk which is basically, a, I've spoken enough about primary education just to give you a context, because if we were to teach AI at primary education level, particularly at school level, why should we have to do? 
Now, at a definitional level, this uh, you know group of people have come up with an interesting definition. I took it, uh, you know, there are various definitions, but I took it as a, an interesting definition for you to consider. AI is an extension of digital literacy, what they call it. Today, everyone needs to have digital literacy in order to survive, but AI literacy is defined as an ability to understand, use, monitor, and critically reflect on AI applications without necessarily being able to develop AI models themselves. In other words, you don't have to be an AI engineer or an AI technologist or somebody who, who has a lot of coding experience, but you need to still understand what is this AI all about and why AI becomes really important. We need to understand and we, used to, we, we have to know how to use AI and we also need to know how to monitor AI and critically reflect AI because there are umpteen reasons why we are saying this and uh, this is so something that the definition captures. Now, with regard to the educational context, context uh, you know, I have put down this uh, definition. Uh, again, uh, you know, these are all borrowed from various sources. So nothing is my own definition. These are all borrowed from various sources. So, uh, you know, I can't claim anything on my own, but it says uh, AI in education encompasses uh, AI capabilities plus the willingness for AI to help inform teaching and learning methods. So in other words, we are saying teaching and learning methods can be actually be influenced by AI and AI capabilities. And for educators, this may consist that adopting a tech powered by AI to achieve faster, fairer grading and, and deliver more robust and even real-time student feedback. So we are all exposed to edtech and we know a variety of edtechs and that's what you are likely to learn over a period of time. And this talk itself is an edtech talk, but uh, this edtech is likely to be powered by a AI going forward. And uh, we have already seen AI influencing edtech in the last decade or so. Although AI as a concept emerged in 1956, in the last uh, one and a half decades, AI has actually taken all of our imagination. And in the last two years, it has even more and moved faster and uh, you know, mainstreamed itself into our lives. So this uh, particular statement says, for educators, AI will enable them to use their tech tools to actually deliver better, grade better, and become make uh, the assessment transparent and provide real-time feedback to students. In other words, you know, teachers are going to use AI to be a, a personalized companion to the learners, to the students. When it comes to students, although this particular statement only talks to chat GPT as an example, basically students are going to tap into AI to basically empower themselves in the higher level thinking. In other words, that rote learning and all that is going to move away. If uh, you want to exploit AI, you can actually move into a higher order thinking pattern. So with uh, this background, I would like to actually spend uh, the next five minutes. Uh, again, uh, I want to call upon you to, you know, encourage you to basically use the chat box, chat function to say a few words about uh, how, as to how you want to see AI literacy spread into schools. Now, I mentioned about uh, what, it, what the current scenario in primary schools. Now, I also mentioned that where we are going as a country, as a society, not only in India, but uh, in the larger uh, sense. But uh, now, uh, I've also mentioned how AI can help students and teachers. You would take, you know, please, uh, you know, put on your take on how you see AI literacy as an important element in schools. What is your take? So use your chat function to, you know, write whatever you feel like. So I'll give you two, three minutes for you to do this. I meant to see anybody contribute. Oh, 
Okay, so the first message is from Saurabh Changanti. Creating activities which include domain knowledge and AI tool corrections, for example. Integrate use of AI tools into learning activities and tasks. Any other comment or any other? So what you are actually writing is, uh, um, you know, a practical application of how AI can relate with the teachers and students in real time. So you are actually calling for uh, activity-based learning where AI could be used. Um, Ramesh Kade is saying, incorporating AI in existing subjects, uh, which is an interesting way to look at. Uh, and in STEM, we have seen this happen. Um, and essay might be written by students, but corrected by AI tools like Grammarly. So we are already seeing some of these in use. And uh, interestingly, we are likely to witness, uh, as uh, Bageshri says, it's not just an additional subject, uh, but it could uh, help uh, students to understand world around them so that uh, they can be equipped with uh, knowledge and skills. It also involves, uh, uh, and uh, you know, this is uh, this is important. Uh, Jayant, uh, you hit the uh, right uh, card. Safety of children is uh, very important. We need to also understand AI literacy becomes important because AI could be misused as well. And uh, you, we have seen this in the on the internet. Uh, the dark web is something that uh, you know we are all concerned about, and AI can also be exploited. It involves knowing that uh, we will need to move from AI literacy to AI competencies, which is uh, you know very very important uh, element. Now, when it comes to primary level, I think uh, uh, it uh, clearly starts with AI literacy, but it has to, as Sadakat says move to AA competencies. So, uh, you know, friends, uh, you, you've uh, put down uh, very, very interesting perspectives and uh, you've uh, brought out uh, the right uh, notions. Let us look at day of AI in this light. Now, this is where I want to introduce day of AI. And, uh, you know, what they are trying to do, exactly as Sadakat mentions, um, they want to first introduce the basics. What is artificial intelligence and what is machine learning and how does it work? So they feel that uh, right from uh, children of uh, age six, they should know what is AI and how machines learn and how does it work and how will AI shape my life and that of my community. And from social media, entertainment, agriculture, travel, you know, somebody mentioned that it uh, affects uh, all facets of our life. And uh, I think, uh, you know, this whole curriculum is around uh, use of AI in our daily life. How this continues to have profound impact on our lives. Now, they have designed the curriculum in a way that AI is for everyone so that uh, students can be empowered with knowledge and skills to understand how they can use, how they can create with these technologies responsibly and ethically. And I think Neha has uh, identified this as uh, an item. Learning about AI as a field would help students in their future professions and also develop AI ethics. I think uh, very early we need to understand what is AI and how does it affect me? How does AI work in real? And how does it affect me? How does it shape up my life? And uh, why it is important for me to understand uh, how if I were to use and exploit AI, I have to do it systematically, responsibly, and ethically. Now, the second set of uh, objectives that they have is uh, identify the benefits and risks of AI. Again, as Neha pointed out, it is um, important for us to teach the social impact of these technologies and the important factors to consider in creating AI applications. And I think earlier Sadakat had mentioned that uh, we have to move away from AI literacy quickly into AI competencies. So if we, get, if we gain AI competencies from a user perspective, but also as a designer perspective, we need to uh, look at the important factors for creating AI applications. This could be ethical factors, social factors, and uh, responsive factors, it could be uh, public good related factors and so on and so forth. 
and how could we use AI in a, a safe environment equitably so that everyone's privacy is respected. This is an important element in our AI literacy component. Finally, AI should be designed equitably and responsibly. So it has to give the students the knowledge to make informed decisions about AI in their lives. So to, to this extent, from moving to basics to understanding the risks and benefits, we have to move the curriculum. And finally, I think again, coming back to Sadakat and others who mentioned the competencies, uh, not only to understand and uh, take the right decision, but to design and create with AI. I think uh, it, this is very, very important. And uh, let us see what this curriculum should deal with. What can I do with AI? How do I train an application that uses AI? Because we need to train bots and use uh, data responsibly and what is the future of this technology and why should I care and how will students shape up the future of AI these are the things that are we are likely to deal with this AI curriculum the day of AI curriculum let us move to quickly gain a glimpse of the primary education curriculum that we are looking at we are looking at uh, what is AI we are putting out a one hour lesson uh, one lesson, one hour, which talks about how does AI, what does AI make you think of? AI in popular culture, because uh, AI differs from culture to culture. In the US, uh, AI may be different to in Japan, to in China, to India. So I think we need to take uh, cognizance of the cultural issues. And uh, what could be the five big ideas of AI that a child of age group five to seven could think about, what could be the examples that uh, he or she can think about is something that we are triggering. When it comes to the second phase of four lessons, four hours, so in, in other words, we are actually having a five hour curriculum for children of uh, age group five to seven, which deals with not only learning what is AI, but uh, uh, learning about uh, what can, what AI can do and what AI cannot do. Like robots, sensors, and algorithms. What could this do today and what could this not do today? In very simple examples. When it comes to the next level, grade three to five or age group eight to 10, we are uh, talking about uh, what is AI again amongst them given the fact that uh, you know today we have to start and uh, there will be a lot of children who are already in uh, uh, age group 8 to 10 so we cannot really straight away go to teachable machines uh, uh, lesson we are still going to teach them what is ai and graduate quickly to teachable machines teach them what is algorithm expose them to learning more about uh, how do machines learn from data and uh, what could be algorithm bias that one can create and uh, concepts like data sets, bias, algorithm, image classification, given that chat GPT 4 plus are also looking at images. And we are all, also very early at the age of eight to 10, talk about uh, AI ethics. You know, whether AI could uh, discriminate, could uh, also invade privacy, how advertisement works today using AI, how there is lack of transparency and uh, human rights uh, you know, within our context, uh, because again here, human rights can differ in different societies. So we are going to limit it to Indian context. So I want to you know, expose to the next level of 11 to 13 age group. And you can imagine at 13, a child is already in eighth standard. So here, in addition to teaching them what is AI, then uh, we are also giving them learning exercises as to how AI could be used to, to create art and what are deep fakes and uh, how are they used in today's, uh, and what are post-truth, how AI can be actually used to actually, you know, create damages in society. Uh, we are also looking at creative side, creative, and generative AI is something that we want to introduce from uh, sixth standard to eighth standard. And uh, how does AI enable us to play games and uh, um, 
how do machines learn new skills from their experience as human beings uh, learn, how do machines also learn, and uh, how AI could be used in uh, reinforcement of learning and rule-based learning and the accountability issues. So I want to stop here and uh, maybe you know conclude my talk by giving a lot of uh, you know food for your thoughts. I think uh, you need to think a lot because uh, I'm I'm only you know bringing to your uh, knowledge that when it comes to designing a curriculum at a primary level, we need to be cognizant cognizant of the fact that uh, a variety of things would need to be looked into. Um, now, I want to conclude with the next uh, slide, which is uh, basically a systemic view. Again, uh, you know, this is from a, a literature review paper somebody had put out. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I would, uh, because I'm, I'm only using this as a, a, a kind of a speaking aid, I'm not actually quoting the source, but uh, if this PowerPoint presentation were to be shared, I will quote all the sources and uh, share with you so that you could use it. But here there is a systemic view of how approaches to learning about AI at K to 12 scenario could be looked into. And some researchers have come up with this systemic view. On the left hand side, you can see that uh, you know the focus could be understanding AI on the left side, where uh, you know how we can learn to recognize artifacts using AI how we need to learn about how AI works and what are the learning tools that are prevalent today and how do we learn for life with AI and somebody in the chat box also mentioned how do we learn for life with AI. So there is one set of uh, curriculum that needs to be developed for understanding AI. Whereas uh, there is also another set of curriculum and this is where I think uh, you as uh, educators and uh, tech uh, uh, and teachers would need to pay uh, a lot of attention uh, to is uh, how do we implement AI and AI learning in particular. So what should be the AI literacy curriculum design? Should AI be included as a subject in uh, K-12 or should it be subsumed in every subject so AI triggered uh, teaching and learning could happen or should it be a standalone subject? And should we also now incorporate, given that students are faster than teachers in uh, experience and, and, uh, and uh, experimenting with the AI, should uh, we incorporate students' perspective in the whole paradigm? And uh, how do we incorporate teacher training, including uh, you know, the B.Ed. and D.Ed., all this uh, teacher pre-service, in-service uh, that happens, how do we incorporate AI in, the, in there, their, uh, you know, continuous professional development, pre-service development, and so on. And uh, uh, how do we implement AI learning uh, and uh, create a lot of support resources? And uh, you know, rightfully, the gender diversity in AI literacy is extremely important because um, you know, we don't want uh, you know, big toys only for big boys. We want uh, everything for everyone so that uh, AI becomes a, a fully pervasive all inclusive, equitable, and uh, 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 equal a uh, tool for equal opportunities. So thank you, colleagues, and thank you, friends, for giving me this opportunity to discuss with you. And um, uh, I have not really talked uh, and touched uh, too much upon uh, uh, a range of things, but I only highlighted what we are trying to do. It's all a learning curve for even us. We are trying to learn how AA can relate with teachers and students at the primary level. There's no single formula as we speak, but uh, it's all co-creation model in a participatory manner. We would like to see something initiated and launched. And uh, I want to end my talk by saying that when we took this curriculum to the state of UP, both the uh, uh, principal secretary responsible for uh, basic education in uh, the government of UP and uh, the uh, chief uh, additional chief secretary who is responsible for uh, Madarsha board education, both of them looked at this curriculum and said, no, this won't work for UP. They simply said, we have to create our curriculum. Number one, there is a language issue. 
Number two, there is also this comprehension issue. Number three is the access issue. So the curriculum cannot be one size fits all. We need to really take this curriculum uh, to the uh, right target audience in the appropriate manner using the right uh, technology and uh, technique to make it uh, pervasive and easier for uh, students and uh, teachers to understand. So that uh, the learning objectives of this AI literacy curriculum is met. And uh, we are having to now look at uh, contextualizing this curriculum for the Indian context, but more so uh, to different provinces. While AI literacy curriculum could mean uh, something differently uh, to the Maharashtrian audience, uh, to an uh, uh, elite uh, um, urban audience where the accessibility is high, it could be different uh, to the rural audience. So we may have to have a lot of examples where uh, the learners, both teachers and students can relate with. So that would make uh, the curriculum really, really interesting and appropriate for our learners. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Uchita. I'm uh, on time, right? Yes, very punctual. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we can open up the floor for questions uh, in case there are any. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask or put them on the chat box. Uh, hello. Yes, Swati. Yeah, myself, Swati. Uh, I'm a research scholar in NEPA. Uh, thank you for uh, organizing this talk. It is very uh, helpful and it is in the beginning stage to understand the AI in education. So I'm very thankful for delivering this uh, session today. I have a concern in the sense that you just now mentioned that not one size curriculum fits all. And uh, um, and if we are uh, we want the curriculum to be context specific, uh, is what I, as I understand it as. Uh, but in that case, uh, even if the curriculum is uh, you know rural context wise, urban context wise is different, etc. How can we ensure that the learning outcomes remain same uh, at the end of the curriculum? No, I think that's a very excellent question and. Uh... Um, you know, the answer can be also, uh, you know, very, very simple. You know, you mentioned that uh, the learning outcomes and the learning objectives should not be diluted. And uh, that is important. And we do not want, uh, you know, uh, children uh, to learn less in a particular geography and have certain children to learn more about it. We want uh, equitable and, uh, yes. um, you know, uh, kind of a common uh, denominator. But that said, uh, what we can do is uh, the examples, the case studies, and uh, the action-oriented learning, um, you know, uh, uh, activities that we come up with could be broad-based. So we could uh, have a very standardized curriculum which would uh, go to places, and uh, you know, people like NEPA and CRT could all work towards uh, standardizing it. But when it comes to choices for teachers to delve into in the classroom and for the, the learners, uh, students to actually relate with, we could have a bouquet, a basket full of activities and choices for them to uh, pick and choose and, uh, you know, delve, delve upon. So that's one way to, one way one could circumvent uh, uh, this issue of uh, language, accessibility barrier and uh, comprehensibility barrier and so on. But I think, uh, you know, our attempt should be to ensure that uh, all children in our country or wherever should be in a position to understand the basic concepts of AI uh, to the extent uh, that we all want uh, it to happen. And, uh, you know, that's where as educators, we need to make a very conscious decision. Thank you. Thank you. Bindu? Yeah, th thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, I just had a concern. We did talk about uh, the lack of resources available in most schools, in uh, especially in rural areas. Uh, when you've uh, designed this AI uh, literacy framework, what are the kinds of resources 
uh, that you're imagining to use and how accesses will, will they be re in realistically, for example, in a rural school, government school? Well, uh, you know, this is uh, an excellent question, uh, Mr. Tirumalai. Um, you know, when it comes to the day of AI curriculum put out by MIT, for each of this uh, level, you know, I, I only highlighted three levels, grades, uh, uh, upper, upper elementary, elementary, upper elementary, and uh, uh, middle school, as they call it in uh, the US system. And uh, we, we go by the age group. They have also put out uh, the recommendation as recommendation what you will need in order to actually deal with this curriculum. Now, uh, interestingly, you see in the US, for upper elementary, which is age group 8 to 10, they say at least one Chromebook or laptop and a projector. And uh, uh, when, we, when we took this to the state of UP, the additional chief secretary said that we don't have all this in our classrooms. So what do we do? So we need to either redefine this curriculum and adapt it to a culture, a situation where there are no projectors, no Chromebooks. So we need to uh, you know, teach it appropriately. That's one of the reasons. Now, SCRT and uh, the uh, different uh, departments are actually developing a curriculum for a non-technology accessible domain, but still um, without uh, the use of a projector and a Chromebook, they want to expose the children to the concepts of AI on uh, the things that they see around. And that's where the ingenuity of uh, the teachers and teacher educators come into play. And Thank you. You, you actually yeah. raised, uh, Dr. Thirumalai, the right question. Thank you. Roshan? Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you. So uh, basically just wanted to understand uh, one, uh, I think you, you might have already uh, tried to touch it. But I would like to reiterate and understand that, like, how much you think that because, especially in the government schools, they do uh, use their mother tongue. I mean, like, mostly if they're they're from like UP or MP, like they speak Hindi, so their school medium is Hindi, right? So, how much you think it, this is going to be act as a a, bar a barrier for you know for going through an AI curriculum? Well, what we are trying to do is, uh, as uh, earlier, uh, you know, Ms. Bindu Thirumalai mentioned, we we have to stand, uh, and also I think uh, the person from NEPA mentioned, uh, you know, we need to ensure that the learning, uh, you know, outcomes, objectives uh, are, uh, are standardized to some extent. But when it comes to delivering, we need to uh, ensure that the delivery is in uh, vernacular languages. So we have created the first cut curriculum with the help of uh, some of the researchers in uh, IIT Khatakpur who helped uh, to uh, contextualize this curriculum uh, for grade uh, for age group uh, uh, for grade three to five. So uh, now the next step would be to number one translate this into the vernacular language. Number two, also look at the cultural context. So if it were to be introduced in UP or the Hindi belt, for instance, uh, you know, are there enough case studies and examples that the people could relate with? Are there examples of uh, certain things that they've never seen, like India Gate? If India Gate is a, as an example or a parliament as an example shown, have the children ever seen it? Or should we take, uh, if it is a UP, um, curriculum should we take it to Bul Bulayan and uh, quote that as an example. So the cultural and language issues are uh, really important, uh, as you mentioned, Roshan, and I think uh, it should not be a barrier. Rather, we should take cultural and language to our advantage while uh, creating awareness and literacy on AI among students. Masuda? Thank you, sir, for your insights. Uh, I would like to uh, ask, as a parent and as a new teacher educator, the whole scenario makes me quite anxious that we've been struggling with pedagogy in various subjects. And even uh, I've taught STEM in school uh, in foreign curriculum, but I don't see that 
quite prevalent yet in many of our Indian schools right now. And now we are here talking about another competency that still needs to be worked on and to be developed. So uh, how what do you think the future is uh, right now, even as for the teacher, uh, uh, teacher training curriculum, where we, they need to be trained in this aspect? And there are a lot of, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, fall pits, they are, that we need to still work upon because our teachers are not that competent enough uh, to deal uh, with uh, even uh, students' uh, emotional well-being along with learning. So it's a lot of things together. No, I think you touched upon the right uh... Uh, you know, quite a few points, you know, in the earlier framework that I showed, uh, some of the researchers have uh, tried to systematically show how AI could impact, but uh, one missing element, uh, as uh, you would have noted, is this uh, whole mental well-being and uh, well-being of uh, learners as well as uh, um, uh, educators. Now, educators are lifelong learners themselves, and, um, you know, everyone's well-being is important. And uh, we have uh, witnessed this in the ERT domain, uh, emergency uh, remote teaching scenario during the COVID pandemic, where a lot of our teachers uh, decided to leave the teaching profession because they couldn't cope with uh, the demand of uh, running these online courses because these are all new for them. Now, we were all taken by surprise and uh, you would be really pleasantly surprised to learn that uh, the School teachers were the, were the ones that uh, coped with uh, the, the, the changes much more than the higher education teachers or TVET teachers or in polytechnics in ITAs and engineering colleges and so on. And uh, teachers, school teachers were so agile. And you would also like to know that, uh, you know, 80% of our school teachers are women. And... Uh, you know, within their home settings, when they were asked to run this uh, uh, this uh, online teaching, they did their best. But uh, uh, a good number of them also went through burnout and, uh, you know, emotional uh, crisis and so on. And, uh, you know, post-COVID, uh, a large number of them wanted to simply leave the teaching profession and do something else. So this points to the fact that uh, there is a, a need for us to not only look at the emotional well-being and uh, the welfare of our, uh, our our learners, our students, but equally our educators and teachers, and that's a concern. Now, teachers are put through a lot of, uh, um, you know, grind, as they would call, uh, in terms of uh, having to learn about uh, curriculum design to pedagogy to assessment to, uh, you know, teaching and learning methods uh, uh, to, to a variety of engagement, uh, student support systems, uh, uh, in in all their teaching learning practices, and the 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 there is a paradigm shift from uh, recycling what uh, uh, you know we once taught uh, twenty years ago to becoming a dynamic, action oriented, project based, problem based learning. Now also AI enabled learning paradigms. So it's going to really take a lot of uh, efforts in terms of uh, you know equipping our teachers for tomorrow and for today. And that's where I think, uh, you know, departments such as Evers will be playing an important role in researching, in uh, writing, in discussing and talking about it, because the, there are no data sets available as, as you speak today. And you yourself mentioned that uh, even when it comes to embedding STEM concepts in curriculum and teaching STEM concepts, uh, uh, including for girls, uh, and so that, uh, you know, girls could take up science education as they grow uh, in their uh, learning paradigm is something that uh, we are experiencing anew, but we have no choice. Now, that is where the, there will be a, a big test for public versus private education and the cost of education. Now, if we were to bring uh, dynamic leaders, uh, teachers, uh, and uh, equip the cadre, we need to invest uh, in uh, teachers, we need to invest in educators. And uh, if the public system would not really invest enough, then the private system is likely to invest. There will be branded schools that are going to invest uh, on their uh, teachers 
and equip them and uh, invest in technology, invest in uh, teaching and learning practices and demonstrate that they are on up. So I think there is go going to be a big uh, you know, challenge for uh, many of us and uh, you know, people like you really understand the public system as well as the private system and why it is important for us to invest in public systems as much as the private system invests in itself and sensitize our, sensitize our policy makers towards the paradigm shift. And, and we have taken some baby steps in terms of bringing this AA curriculum to the teaching domain, teacher's domain. But I think uh, as researchers, have, as uh, ed tech uh, leaders of tomorrow, you need to really do a lot of research and uh, bring to the attention of the policymakers the challenges and opportunities facing tomorrow's education if India were to be a Vishwaguru, as uh, the Prime Minister wants uh, India to be. I think we need to really jolt the public system. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor, for such a wonderful session. I'm sure uh, your session will make everyone think of the aspects which we haven't thought of before. Uh, we will now move on to the next session, which is the close group uh, session with the interaction session with the MAT group our students, uh, those who wants to stay back for uh, the, uh, to know more about uh, the MAT, you can stay back in the main room, but the students will move to the uh, breakout room with uh, professor. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, uh, Utita has opened the room. Utita, can you stop the recording? Yes.